first scripture for today comes from Isaiah chapter 40, verses 1 through 11. Um, you can find this in the Old Testament um, on page 627. Comfort, O oh, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that she has served her term, that her penalty is paid, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries out, in the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level and the rough places a plain. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all people shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry out. And I said, what shall I cry? All people are grass. Their constancy is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades, when the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Get you up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good tidings. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good tidings. Lift it up, do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. See, the Lord God comes with might, and his arm rules for him. His reward is with him, and his recompense before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms and carry them in his bosom and gently lead the mother sheep. Let us hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. Well, there was this rather awkward moment at a children's story. It did not happen here, so don't worry. The preacher was telling the story and addressed the children saying, what is gray has four legs, a bushy tail, which climbs trees and gathers acorns. One of the bright students looked rather quizzically at the preacher and said, uh, I'm somewhat confused by your question. Well, what do you find confusing about this question? The bright student answered, well, the answer to your question is quite obviously a squirrel, but we're in church, and isn't the answer always supposed to be Jesus? <laughs> well, <clears throat> like that rather bright student, I think we get a little confused whenever we read the prophets of ancient Israel. Like that child, we're so busy looking for Jesus that we miss the powerful, vital things the ancient prophets had to say. I remember once when I was in high school and I was at church camp, there was this very, very bright uh, student giving us the, a lecture on the prophets of ancient Israel. And he was saying that the prophets predict the coming of Jesus. And then he would unfold the passages of the Hebrew Bible, those passages that line up with what we see in the New Testament. And I don't know, but there was just this sort of whisper running through my mind of suspicion. It just didn't seem right. The presenter just seemed to bounce from this sentence to that phrase, back to another sentence to another phrase, in kind of a hodgepodge and a mismatch. And it just struck me as 
nonsensical. That each verse seemed to be taken out of context, twisted ever so much to fit this idea that prophecy was prediction. And I got the sneaking suspicion that if we just stayed at that text a little bit longer, we might learn so much more. So through these Sundays of Advent, I want to convince you that my confusing moments in high school were well worth all the confusion and that there's something so much more to be gleaned from the prophets of ancient Israel than a prediction of the future. I hope to convince you there's so much more. The portion we are considering this morning is from the prophet Isaiah. Written at the time of Israel's liberation from captivity. In 586 BCE, the Babylonians conquered Israel, and Nebuchadnezzar's plan to keep the conquered people docile was to deport the leaders of the community all throughout the empire under the belief that if the people did not have their leaders, they would be less able to challenge and revolt against the Babylonian Empire. And in 439, before the Common Era, Cyrus the Great defeats Nebuchadnezzar and he issues the edict which says, Israel can go home. And the prophet Isaiah writes in response to that joyful, wonderful moment. Now, one of the main uh, uh, images that the prophet Isaiah uses is the image of a heavenly court, that God is enthroned on God's, in God's that God is on his throne in glory, and that God is surrounded by a multitude of other beings. And Isaiah is present. And while Isaiah is present, he hears things that most mortals are not privy to. There are three voices in this passage. The first voice is the voice of God, offering an explanation for what the experience of exile meant. The second voice is a voice of encouragement for their journey. And the third voice is a voice of hope and of promise. And all three voices intertwine to speak a word of comfort to them and to us. The first voice is the offering of some explanation for what this horrible experience means. God says, tell Israel that her sentence is complete. The image is that they were incarcerated for 70 years. And with the edict of Cyrus, it is as if the prison sentence has been completed. The price has been paid. They have endured 
the just consequences of their actions, and the bitterness of yesterday is over. The first voice is a voice of explanation. You know, our imaginations are precious gifts to us. And if you are willing to trust your imagination, if you're willing to offer it not as something that is contrary to prayer, but intimately connected to prayer, there will be a rich harvest. Just as Isaiah imagined, the end of a sentence, the end of a prison sentence, was the beginning of a new life of freedom. So often we downplay and we devalue our imaginations. We think they're something apart from God's grain and God's glory. But I'd encourage you to trust your imagination. I had an experience of that this week. I'd like to share it with you. My Aunt Dot died, I told you that a while ago, and uh, we had her funeral service yesterday. And my imagination ran wild, and I'm so glad that it did. I began to think about my life with Aunt Dot, And every now and then, when she was living in Methuen, uh, my cousin Dottie Jean would take care of all of her, her business and things, but I would stop by to visit her whenever I could. Now, Aunt Dot, she just loved Chinese food. And I know where every Chinese food restaurant in Methuen, Massachusetts is. The last time I saw her, she said, uh, I want some crab rangoon. So dutifully, I went down to the, to the local Chinese restaurant and I got Aunt Dot an order of crab rangoon, brought it to her in her nursing home. I gave it to her. And she took it from my hand, gratefully. And then she, she picked up one of these pieces of crab rangoon, saying, uh, do you want one? Now, when your 82-year-old aunt, who is dying in her nursing home bed, offers you some crab rangoon, of course you want it. And she handed it to me as if it was the holiest of hosts. I ate it, and she smiled. A precious gift of my imagination is that that smile will stay with me. Oh, church, do not scold your imagination when it goes out to harvest the beautiful and the holiness of life. Isaiah did it. He saw meaning in their liberation. The sentence had come to an end. The first voice asks us to trust that our imaginations are gifts and not threats. The second voice that Isaiah is privy to, we don't know that if it was God or another member of the heavenly court, but the voice seems to address the very geological 
foundations of that land, commanding the valleys to rise up and commanding the mountains to lower themselves. Ancient Israel is a little bit like the state of Vermont, high peaks and low valleys. In fact, if you try to travel east to west, you have to go up and down and up and down. The second voice the prophet hears is a, is a voice to creation itself. Make the way easy for Israel to come home. Lift up yourselves, valleys. Lower yourself, O mountains, that the way of God can be trod by a faithful people who have endured their sentence and are now free. The third voice of this ancient prophet is a voice that speaks of an enduring hope, even in the face of what is difficult and burdensome. And each one of us here, here today knows too well our own difficulties, our own burdens, and our own struggles. And to us and to Isaiah, the word of God is this. That the purposes of God are so intimately connected to my life and to yours that whatever the struggle is in this present moment, it is connected to a deeper promise that yes, we are like grass, we wither and we fade, but we are also deeply rooted in an eternal promise that will prevail. I bid us to trust that promise, find comfort in that hope. Whenever I think that thought, I'm reminded of an old Baptist hymn. Don't worry, I will not sing it. I'd ask the EP to do it, but they're pretty busy right now. My life flows on in endless song above earth's lamentations. I hear the sweet, though far off hymn that hails the new creation. Through all the tumult and the strife, I hear the music ringing. It finds an echo in my soul. How can I keep from singing? What though my joys and comforts die, the Lord my Savior liveth. What though the darkness gather round, songs in the night God giveth. No storm can shake my inmost calm while to that refuge clinging. Since Christ is Lord of heaven and earth, how can I keep from singing? When tyrants tremble, sick with fear, and hear their death knell ringing, when friends rejoice both far and near, how can I keep from singing? in prison cell, 
and dungeon vile, our thoughts to them go winging. When friends by shame are undefiled, how can I keep from singing? I lift my eyes, the cloud grows thin, I see the blue above it. And day by day this pathway smooths, since first I learned to love it. The peace of Christ makes fresh my heart, a fountain ever springing. All things are mine since I am his. How can I keep from singing? No, the ancient prophets weren't gypsies at a sideshow with a crystal ball, able to predict what would happen someday in the future. The ancient prophets were those who trusted their imaginations as God spoke a word, a means of understanding, a word of encouragement forward, and a word of hope to hang in and to keep singing. And all of those things, all of those things are what we who follow Jesus find in his presence among us. It's not so much that they predicted, it's that they made way the path for us to receive the precious gift in Jesus. Amen.